All right, how is it going, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Forward Thinking Founders, where we're talking to founders about their companies, their visions for the future, and how the two collide. Today, I am very excited to be talking to Sarah Moskoff, who is the creator and founder of Winnie. Sarah, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. I remember when I first came across Winnie on Twitter, I, which is where I hear about a lot of the companies that come on. Uh, I was checking it out and I saw that you were in the education space and I saw that I needed you to get on as soon as possible so we could jam about education. So with that, let's dive right into it. Can you tell everyone listening uh, that doesn't know about your company what you're working on? Yeah, so Winnie is a marketplace for childcare and early education. Uh, in other words, we help parents find daycare and preschool. Um, and we've been around for almost four years now, uh, just working on this problem of making childcare more accessible to more people across the United States and, and hopefully soon the world. That's awesome. I want to dive into what life was like before Winnie for these parents. So you obviously started this company for a reason, solving a problem. Can you give us an idea of what, uh, what this looked like before Winnie existed? And then we can talk about how Winnie works. Yeah, so I started Winnie really out of a personal need. Uh, and then it turned out to not just be my own personal need, but something that lots of parents needed. Uh, so I actually had my first daughter. Um, I was working at the time at a tech startup. And I went back to work very shortly after having my daughter um, and realized that there were a lot of things I was struggling with as a working parent. And like there just wasn't a lot of infrastructure set up to support households with two working parents. Like we are still uh, operating very much as if there's a stay at home parent in, in all these households. Um, and when I started talking to my coworker at the time, Ann Halsell, uh, she had two young kids at the time and was experiencing a lot of the same thing, same things I was. We realized that this was actually bigger than just us. Millennials uh, are really the first generation where the majority of households uh, don't have a stay-at-home parent and are facing all these struggles trying to balance work life and family life. Um, and so we knew there was an opportunity here. We didn't quite know what that would look like and how we could use technology to solve their problems. But when we kind of looked around, we you know, had both worked at Google and I had worked at Twitter and, and these other tech companies. Uh, and we just felt like the, the best tech talent, the best engineers we had worked with were not, were not solving these problems for parents. And so we just felt this, this draw to quit our jobs and start Winnie and really bring technology to parenting. Um, and that has kind of led us to childcare, um, which wasn't obvious right away to us. But as we started working on the problem, we realized the biggest lever we had to help parents was to help them find childcare. Scratching your own itch is, from what I've learned, one of the best ways to start a company because you already have that insight and then you just solve your own problem. So let's dive into how Winnie works. So let's say I am a founder of a company or an employee of a company and I have young children who are in preschool uh, and I was having or I am having the same struggles that you were having. Mm -hmm. I would go to winnie.com and how does it work? Does it connect me automatically? Do I search? Mm -hmm. Is it like Uber? Can you kind of go into how the model works? Yeah, so we uh, at Winnie collect really comprehensive data about every licensed daycare and preschool. Um, and this sounds really basic and obvious. Uh, and I thought for sure something like this must, must exist. Um, so it's not that novel or uh, the, the basic concept is, is pretty, pretty basic. <laughs> we have data on every licensed daycare and preschool and everything from you know, how much it costs, to what age of kids they accept, to whether they have open spaces and reviews from parents who have sent their child there. Um, and so this data was actually something that people would get pretty much offline before Winnie. 
Um, they'd ask around, uh, they, you know, might do a search in Google, um, but the results would be, you know, varied depending on where they live and what kind of data was available. Um, and it was pretty novel for us to bring all these providers online, especially because over half of the providers we learned in the process of doing this had no presence on the internet. Um, and so there's this kind of perception among parents that childcare is really inaccessible um, and that there's not enough of it. And, and that is certainly a factor, um, but there was a lot of childcare and preschool options that just people didn't know about. Um, and uh, a lot of the quality was really obscured to parents like there you couldn't figure out whether your provider was even licensed without doing a deep search of the child care licensing database which no normal parent would actually do um and so just by bringing that information online like that was kind of the first step making that all just really uh accessible to parents so it's kind of like google but for specifically searching for daycare and preschool in your area um, but now beyond that, we have this marketplace because all these, it didn't just attract parents, it attracted all these providers um, who in many cases are not tech savvy and didn't have a presence on the internet. And we created one for them. We, we did the kind of heavy lifting piece um, and we meet them where they are uh, because we've built a lot of technology and tools to, to be able to do that. Um, and so it's, it's very easy for them to maintain their listing on Winnie and, and the data that's out there. Um, and they can really now focus on just running their business, um, providing great childcare and early education, which is what they do best anyway, um, and not have to focus so much on marketing their business. That's very cool. And uh, I am also surprised that we, you know, as a kind of as a country and as a world, uh, you know, I guess at the time, which would be 2015, wouldn't have something like this, but that's kind of something like a directory or some uh, kind of getting all the information online. But when you find that gap, um, it's uh, when, you, when you found that gap, was it an obvious decision to, to, to go for it? Or what went through your mind when you realized that this basic information of these preschools, of these daycares, were online and no one was doing it? Did you automatically think it had to be you? No, and it's kind of embarrassing. Like it took so many things kind of hitting us over the head over and over again, telling us we had to work on this problem um, before we really realized like we have to work on this problem. So we started Winnie as just a mobile app um, and it was kind of this app that did a bunch of different things. Um, one of the things it did was have a community of parents who could ask questions and get advice. And it also had this kind of directory of all kinds of places um, across the United States. And so we were really unfocused. Uh, and childcare was certainly one of the things on our mind, but it was not the only thing. Um, and I think like many founders, we were really ambitious. We wanted to kind of boil the ocean. Um, and it really took our users uh, making it very clear to us through the data on Winnie and also um, other data that, you know, just if you look at Google search traffic for the word daycare over the past five years, like it's, it's gone up a lot. And most search terms uh, don't actually increase in volume because Google has all the market share. Um, and so it took a bunch of these things kind of making it very obvious to us that uh, we really needed to focus on this one problem, which was helping parents find childcare. And it's a huge problem. It's a huge market. Um, so it, it's not, it's not even, a, you know, we, we probably aren't even focused enough, um, but it, it is kind of embarrassing uh, how long it took us to realize that this was such a, a huge need that was being filled by no one. Um, and that by just providing this information, we could kind of quickly grow in terms of users and traction. Um, and that would enable us to layer on other functionality that was really useful. 
Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's awesome. And it's a, it's a good insight into that. I think from afar, a lot of people, including myself, see founders of giant companies and they just seem like, oh, they, they, it was, it's obvious. Of course, they figured it out 10 years ago. But while you're in the, the thick of it, um, I think you just proved that it's never that obvious. You just kind of got to listen to your users, as you said and uh, and uh, build what they want while using your intuition. So I think that's a very valuable insight. I'd love to hear, you know, you, you've you been doing this now for, for four years. Uh, you're, you've had some massive success. You're very high ranked on, on, on Google. Your Alexa score is high. You, you've, uh, do you mind sharing, if you're open to sharing the numbers, like how many providers or, or I guess, what's your scale? And then if you're open to sh sharing, and if not, I'd love to hear just like, what does the vision look like for Winnie and what direction are you rowing in? Uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think the latest public numbers that we've shared are, you know, we've helped over 4 million parents find childcare. Um, and we have 150,000 providers on our platform. Um, and so, yeah, it, it it has a lot of scale, but there's a lot more than 4 million parents and uh, there's more than 150,000 providers. So we have, we have our work cut out for us. And then there's a lot more that we can help them with in, in a much deeper way. So today parents use Winnie, um, you know, mostly to discover their childcare options. Uh, and then they kind of figure out their list of, of providers they're interested in. And then the rest kind of happens off platform. Um, for the most part. And so there's a lot more in that process that we can play a role in. Yeah, I'd actually love to dive into that. I think that you might be one of the uh, the latest companies, um, latest in, you mean in stage to come onto the podcast, which means we can get some super valuable information that many guests aren't even able to, to talk about. So you've already reached this, this certain level of scale. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear you're operating, obviously, in multiple markets, multiple verticals. You, you're, you're, you have a company, right? Um, how do you think about distribution moving forward now that you obviously have a, have a, a handle on your unit economics and whatnot? Um, how do you think about distribution channels? Yeah, so we get our users today mostly for free um, and a lot of them come through Google so people will search for daycare in San Francisco and find Winnie that way because Winnie ranks at the top of search results um, but what we find in the markets where we have a lot of traction uh, like you know the some of the markets in California Texas Illinois New York where we've been the longest um, and have the most users uh, we actually have a lot of direct traffic. So people who come to Winnie.com or download the Winnie app um, directly. Uh, and so we attribute that to word of mouth, um, which is, I think, even better. Um, and so that is kind of the effect we're trying to grow in, in more markets. And I think the best way to do that is by building something that's really, really useful to parents. Um, and we've found that like the more, the more we actually, it, it, it correlates really well with NPS score, the net promoter score, NPS. Uh, and so the higher our NPS is in a market, the, typically those are the markets where we're seeing the most word of mouth traffic, um, which makes sense. These are promoters, they're telling, they're telling people about it. Um, and so we just constantly work on making Winnie more useful. Um, of course, like we also have to build a business here. Um, and so the nice thing about the business that we're building is that we think it's very aligned with a more useful product. The more useful Winnie is um, for parents who use our product entirely for free. Um, there is no paid product for parents on, on Winnie today, uh, and that's by design. Um, then the more parents will come and use Winnie. Uh, and today, the way we monetize is is through the providers who are looking to fill their open spaces. And so, uh, you know, the more the more parents we can spend send their way that will they'll possibly enroll in their programs, the more money we make. Um, and so, uh, it's, our revenue model is very aligned with growth. And so that that is nice. Um, but we're you know thinking about 
as we now are making money, um, we don't have to just have users come to us for free. Uh, and there may be ways to accelerate growth in new regions that are interesting. Um, just last week, I was at a national early education conference where we got to talk to a lot of providers on the ground. And of course, stuff like that costs money to attend and uh, promote yourself at and get in front of providers, but it, it's super valuable. Um, and so we may start to use more of those channels um, to actually reach providers where they are um, and uh, reach parents where they are. That's fantastic. The fact that you up to this point have gotten so many of your, of your, your users and, and, the, and the parents on the platform from word of mouth. I feel like that's the dream. And that is what has enabled you, I'm sure, to, to grow to such scale already. I talked to a lot of founders who from day one, they're thinking about growth with paid ads, Facebook, Google, YouTube, uh, just from even at the seed stage. Um, and uh, I, I don't necessarily know uh, how I feel that. I don't have, like, I don't have a full opinion on it. I'm kind of curious, um, although you haven't done it for yourself, do you have an opinion on uh, just ads in general and if there are certain businesses that, that should be doing ads and if so, like what stage a company should be doing ads? I'm curious if you have any thoughts there, the fact that you didn't do them as a conscious choice. Well, we were kind of in this tricky position because our product is free for parents and providers. And it wasn't until we reached a, a, enough scale. And so that was very recently that we started making any money um, because the scale is what made it so that providers were willing to pay money for the parents using Winnie. Um, so there's sort of a chicken and egg. I think if you have a product that makes money from day one, you know, you sell widgets, then of course you can advertise your product um, as long as that advertising uh, costs less than the widget you sell. Um, and so uh, I think that that actually is something ironically, but maybe not so ironically, we've gotten dinged on uh, when talking to investors, like they want to re wanted to really understand what it costs to acquire users. And when we were like, well, we get them all for free, um, you know, they felt like that wasn't a good answer because eventually uh, we're, we're making money off those users in, in some way. Um, and so to have a really concrete understanding of what are your channels for acquiring them and how much do those different channels cost um, is actually you know, a muscle that you're building as a company. So we're, we're building that now a little bit, um, now that we do make money and can kind of understand like what are the different channels for acquiring users that do cost money and how, how can we best use them? And they're not all created equal, um, you know, for us, like because search is so important, uh, there, there is paid search. Um, and so you can pay to, to rank um, and actually accelerate your, your organic traffic that way. So uh, I, I think it is an important muscle to build. You just have to make sure that you're not falling into this trap of spending more to acquire users than you actually make from those users. Uh, so you have to be disciplined about it. And um, especially if you're a venture-backed company, like that discipline has to come from from you uh, to build a sustainable company. Otherwise, uh, it's very easy to trick yourself into thinking like, oh, you're, you know, you can acquire users profitably if you look at it this way with this kind of new math. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of companies fall into that trap. That's super insightful. I appreciate that. I have one last question on the business and kind of the, the product today, and then we'll move into uh, what Winnie looks like in the future, and then some some unrelated questions to Winnie. So, you have it seems like you've built a marketplace where there's two sides, right? Um, and a lot of companies want to be marketplaces because once you hit liquidity and once you hit scale, it kind of like a flywheel. But there's always the chicken and egg problem. Do you get like you need demand, you need supply? How do you get them yeah. going at the same time? would love to hear um, if you can outline uh, back in the early days, how did you think about the chicken and egg problem for your providers? And uh, um, how do you reach scale with this, this problem that so many people have a challenge uh, dealing with? Yeah, so we kind of got around it by 
you know, faking supply, if you will. Like we don't require providers to have any relationship with Winnie to be listed on our platform. We certainly don't require them to pay. Um, and it turns out when you do give this away for free and you give them families interested in their programs for free, uh, generally they will come onto your platform and use your product because you are already showing them value. Um, and so that was kind of how we solved for the supply side. Um, of course, you know, now we have to convert a lot of those free users into users on the provider side into businesses that, you know, we're getting some kind of share in their success. Um, so that's tricky or from a monetization perspective, but it made our platform work really well uh, for parents. Um, and so by kind of having all the supply, no matter what, we were able to aggregate the demand because the, the biggest thing that was missing in the market was a way to ha have fully comprehensive information about every supplier that's out there. Um, so we, I think Winnie really benefited from the, the childcare market being so incredibly fragmented. I don't know that there's other markets that are as fragmented as childcare. Like, honestly, I think it is one of the most fragmented markets. Um, if you just look at, it's a $60 billion industry, the daycare services industry. Um, and there's no one with any more than a couple percentage points of market share. And, and even those folks, um, there, there's very few and the rest is, is super long tail. Um, and so it was really a market that benefited from having a, a single platform um, in a way that I'm not sure, you know, other founders ask me all the time, like, how can I apply what Winnie is to my vertical? Um, and I'm not sure it works for every vertical uh, because it's really like one of the last industries to be online and also happens to be incredibly fragmented. Yeah, it's about, it's about definitely picking the right market for sure. And it sounds like you picked a, picked a great one. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time thinking about um, higher ed and uh, mm -hmm. education of, you know, high school, college and beyond. And, and I've noticed that the job market is changing a little bit in that you know some colleges don't require sorry some uh, jobs don't require degrees you have some boot camps like you know schools like lambda school or microverse that are yeah. skilling up that allow you to not need a degree from these four-year universities i would just love to hear your opinion thoughts uh on that world of the changing job market and how you feel um about that as a kind of kind of almost a provider or provider for providers of the very early stages of education. How do you think about the ramp up uh, to adulthood? Yeah, so a few things. One, I think about the changing job market a lot from the perspective of the kind of care, uh, child care that parents need. Like the fact that more families um, have two working parents, at least part time, um, and that more jobs are what I would call flexible jobs or don't work on a traditional nine to five schedule. Um, so more jobs are like an Uber driver or you rent out your Airbnb or you do a combination of these things um, or you're going back to, to school to change career tracks or you know learn to, to code. Um, all of these things don't fit into like the traditional way that people used to graduate college, have a career, or work in that job till they died <laughs> or retired. Um, and so childcare needs to look a lot different because it, it, it needs to support these families. It needs to be way more flexible. Um, it needs to, to work around their schedules. Um, and it doesn't, childcare doesn't really look like that today. It's, it's basically like you get your full-time daycare spot or maybe your part-time preschool. Um, but if you need more flexible care, drop-in care, um, that is, is really hard to find. Um, and it's really hard to find for the, the right price. Um, so I think that is something we think a lot about at Winnie, how to support the changing 
needs of families, um, changing landscape. Uh, as far as education goes and like preparing children for the future, I mean, I think there's way more research today that shows that early education, um, so those zero to five years are actually really instrumental. Um, it's, it's not just about keeping your child alive. Um, there's quite a bit that you can do in those early years to influence their outcomes for the rest of their life that, that might even matter uh, more than whether they have a college degree. Um, and that doesn't mean like teaching your infant to read and write. <laughs> uh, it means exposing them to certain kinds of play and certain social emotional skills and other children um, and qualified trained early educators uh, actually do matter. Um, and so anyway, I think a lot about like helping parents assess the quality of the early education their children are getting. Um, and especially as jobs become uh, more flexible, perhaps more remote, um, perhaps you can work from anywhere you want. Um, people may make decisions about where to live based on the education their children are getting. And that's not, not as crazy as it sounds. Like people today make decisions based on kind of elementary school and middle school and high school education for their children, uh, make decisions about where to live. Um, and you could imagine that extending to early education, um, making decisions about where to live based on the preschools that are available or the childcare that's available and the quality of that care and the cost of that care, um, the accessibility of that. So uh, I think it, it will become way more important and uh, way more uh, something that, that parents think about, not just in terms of like, can I get childcare or not, but actually the quality of the care they're getting, that early care. It's a very thoughtful, you, you've definitely spent a lot of time thinking about this, I can tell. And it's a, it's one of these things that I feel like the future is just going to unfold. And, and we, as a, as, as, as technologists, as founders, as a species, just need to adapt as best as we can and build for it and try to get ahead mm -hmm. of the changes, um, which is what it sounds like you're doing. I have a couple more questions for you. I would love to hear um, from your experience building Winnie, what have been some of the biggest things or most influential things that you've learned um, along the journey? Uh, maybe some learnings that you didn't necessarily expect to, to learn. And um, yeah, it's actually, I would just love to hear about what you've learned so far. Oh boy, I've learned so much. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the the biggest thing that I've learned is like it, it when starting a company, especially, um, but this can also apply to just building a new product feature. Um, it really can feel like an up, uphill battle. Um, like you're constantly just like pushing against the tide and, <laughs> forcing your, your product on people. Um, and I always heard about this like elusive product market fit thing. <laughs> and I was like, well, that isn't real. Like you just got to have hustle and you must just like hustle your way and you keep growing, keep working at it. And like eventually it gets there. Um, and especially for me personally, like having come from big companies um, or at least, you know, companies with larger user bases. Um, it was kind of like that. Like you could kind of iterate your way there with a product um, or feature um, and get it to the point where like enough people used it that it was valid and mattered. Um, and what I learned in, in starting Winnie is like you can, only, you can only have that hustle for so, so much of the, the product. Like, of course you always have to have a lot of hustle when starting a company, but there is a such thing as product market fit. Um, and when you find it and have it, it doesn't mean you don't have, have to keep working. Um, 
but growth will happen without you having to fight for every one of those users <laughs> and every bit of that growth. And it's not about iterating, it's about like an order of magnitude or multiple orders of magnitude difference in how people respond to your product. And so, you know, we did a lot of things. We built a lot of stuff before we realized that the thing that could be most helpful was helping parents find daycare and preschool. Um, and once we started building that and rolling it out market by market, um, it, the, that had true product market fit. Like it would just grow <laughs> and people would find it and they would tell other people about it. And even without doing anything or changing the feature set whatsoever, you know, if we all go home for the month of December, the product will still grow. Um, and I think that is like the biggest difference. Like we used to, we used to have Decembers where like, you know, the, our numbers would tank because we'd, we'd not be working. Um, and that, that just won't be the case this holiday. <laughs> it, it will just grow. Um, and so I think that is like something like you have to, you really have to be honest with yourself about when uh, something has true product market fit or not, um, because you can only kind of force growth for so long um, before the thing does really need to have its own engine for growing that is beyond stuff you're doing to get the word out. It's a fantastic description of product market fit. One of the best I've heard. Uh, is it is it scary once you've hit it? Is there a day that you wake up and you're, you just hit growth and it never stops. Can you describe when yeah. you realize that you had product market fit, that like moment? Yeah, so it, it is kind of, I, I feel a lot of anxiety around like, am I providing the best product experience? Um, so like one example is we just found out we had like a ton of users in Seattle. Um, and this was before, we had done any data collection in Seattle or had providers on our platform in Seattle. Um, we were ranking in Google search results for daycare in Seattle and like tons of people in Seattle were finding Winnie um, and their experience was not great. Uh, and, and so like that kind of stuff gives me a lot of anxiety. Um, and I'm like, of course, like we have to quickly launch Seattle and we quickly collected data for all of Washington state. Um, and now it's a lot better there, but like that we're, it's constant. We're trying to keep up with now regions where we have usage, um, rather than before where like we would have no users in a region and then we'd have to go into that market and start collecting data and getting users. Now we see the users before we have data. Um, and it gives me a lot of anxiety because I know we can do better for them and uh, we're not. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a different kind of pressure <laughs> um, knowing that you're not providing, you're providing like a, a product experience you're not super happy with. Um, but I, I still think it's, it's better than the status quo, which is why people find us and use us even when we're not perfect. I was listening to a podcast once that was saying, once you found product market fit, everything will be on fire and you have a choice. You can put out that fire or that fire or that fire, but you can't put out all of them. So you got to pick and choose which fires to put out. Is that, uh, would you say that's kind of like a similar experience for you? Yeah. And we actually started a, a shared doc at our, at Winnie with, you know, internal employees of fires we are choosing not to put out. And it is kind of satisfying to just write something on there so that we kind of recognize that this thing exists and we know it's broken um, and we're just choosing not to address it right now. Um, it kind of makes us all feel a little better. Uh, but yeah, like that is, that is the struggle with prioritization. Um, and I feel that, you know, every day and especially because I kind of refuse as a parent to spend my nights and weekends when I don't have to on Winnie. And I, I set that tone for the rest of the company. Like I don't want us putting out fires that are not the highest priority fires, even if we can, um, because I don't think it's sustainable. 
that's what you do as a CEO. You just you got to make make the hard decisions and allocate resources. Yeah. And I think everyone listening, or I, I think a lot of people listening, hope to find product market fit one day, just to find you know to be in the position that you were in or you are in, and which is a whole another game. Um, but I think you're right. I, I that is a game that uh, sounds. Like I personally would rather have found product market fit than not, because it means you built something that's useful to a lot of people. Um, but you just got to be ready for the other side. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. Well, a couple more questions for you before we wrap it up. So you have, you know, you built a, a, a company and it's growing. And as you've mentioned, it has product market fit. And as I said, it's, it, it, you're at a point where a lot of people want to be at. And the fact that there's a lot of people that just want to start a company period, they want a product to sell. They want to be in a market or solve a problem, but they don't necessarily know the best first step on how to, do that. Uh, I'm curious, what advice or tips or knowledge would you want to tell someone who wants to start a company but doesn't know the first step to do so? The first step is to get started. <laughs> and if that means removing, kind of lighting a fire under yourself, so removing a lot of your, your comforts that would mean that you're not getting started, then do that. So quit your job. Uh, figure out how long you can do this without an income, and that will light a fire under you to figure things out. Um, I think, you know, when I when people ask me this question, a lot of times they're working at a company um, and making a comfortable salary, and they don't want to give that up, but they also kind of want to know how to how to test their their thing. And there's that certainly. Uh, you can certainly do that and try that. But if you're really struggling to figure out what are your first steps, I think the, the best thing you can do is, is kind of remove all the things that are stopping you from getting started. Um, and the biggest thing is probably your job <laughs> and the fact that you uh, go to work every day and, and earn a comfortable salary. Um, and so quitting that and forcing yourself to, to figure stuff out. And typically people have kind of a limited runway that they can just work without earning any money um, or, or raising money so that they could pay themselves a salary. Um, it, it will force you to figure out what are the best ways to test your idea. Um, and also you'll, if, if you go out and raise money, like you'll be testing it with the market of investors, um, which is also a valid way to test if, if you have, if you're onto something. I love that that was your, your advice and, and tip because I, that's exactly kind of the, the situation that I was in a couple of years ago. I want to share a short story for the people listening to kind of give more, kind of more insight into, into, you know, what you just said that like I had a job um that was fine it, i was enjoying it but i had all these startup ideas and uh, i didn't have much savings uh and i didn't have even a product that was making money but i really wanted to just do this startup thing and see what would happen if i did it so i quit my job and i lived on uh, two credit cards and my customer my short my little customer revenue at the time that grew um mm -hmm. and if i wouldn't have done that i don't know where i would be now um but the fact that i took that risk early um, has allowed me to kind of catapult my network and career and knowledge, which allows me now, yes, I have some debt. Yes, I have some like battle scars, but um, there, there's no way I would be where I am now network wise and knowledge wise if I wouldn't have just taken the leap. So I, I say all that to just back up what you say and that I fully agree. And you're not going to truly do it until you're, you're selling for your rent, selling for your life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the last, uh, the last question. I have for you is uh, one of my favorite ones becoming uh, becoming I think my favorite and it is the fact that we have all these people listening that are interested in helping the guests they they might have a connection or knowledge that, that you might need so so my question for you is as a startup founder um, what is an ask that you have for the forward-thinking founder community um, that, you, that you have for all of us would, that is something we could potentially help you with um, or assist you with, or what can we do for you? So one is definitely if you are a parent or you know a parent, tell them to check out Winnie 
winnie.com uh, to find daycare and preschool or also just they have a daycare and preschool or preschool that they they love review that daycare preschool on Winnie because those reviews from parents who have set their child there are, are really valuable to new parents who are looking for, for child care. Um, but beyond just using Winnie and telling all your friends about it, um, I think one of the like m things I've learned <laughs> just through the process of building Winnie is like caregiving in general is not really valued in our society child care providers are not paid enough. Um, we don't value it in the workplace. We, you know, for a very long time, didn't even think of it as like a thing. Like I, I I'm asked all the time by investors, like why, why is Winnie needed now? People have been having kids forever. Um, and it's like, there was this hidden labor that was done by primarily women that, had no value ascribed to it um, that turns out is quite valuable raising the next generation of humans um, so i would just ask that like we we think about caregiving as really a, a really really valuable uh position um without which like we could not function as a society um and we ascribe like the appropriate value to it, <laughs> it monetary value to it um, and, and kind of think about the care providers that work at your company, or, uh, you may be a child care provider, you may use child care providers and, and really like elevate their value. Cause I think that is really like the way we will make progress is when we start to really value this, this activity that is is being done and has been done for generations um, without being valued at all. All right, you all heard of the asks, get to work. Uh, well, cool, Sarah, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. I learned a ton about an industry, a specific need, a part of an industry that I did not know anything about. So I appreciate you educating me and, and the listeners and appreciate you just spending some time on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun.